do in and through this church. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it was September 15th, 1887. She was writing from Tung Chow, China. Her name is Lottie Moon. And she was writing to her supporting churches uh, back in the States. And she wrote these words. How many there are who imagine that because Jesus paid it all, they need pay nothing. And she's not talking about contributing to the forgiveness of sins, but the idea of raising funds for missions. They need pay for nothing, forgetting that the prime object of their salvation was that they too should follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ in bringing back a lost world to God. Two weeks later, she writes from the city of Ping Tu, China, Lottie wrote these words, the needs of these people press upon my soul and I cannot be silent. It is grievous to think of human souls going down to death without one opportunity of hearing the name of Jesus. I urge upon the consciences of my Christian brothers and sisters the claims of these people among whom I dwell. Here I am working alone in a city of thousands with numberless villages clustered around. How many can I reach? She then says this, why this strange indifference to missions? Why these scant contributions? She was not a shy woman at all. Why these scant contributions when approved men and women are asking to be sent to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ to unbelieving people? And in response to these letters, beginning in 1918, our family of Great Commission Baptist churches began collecting offerings known as the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. Here at Grace Life, we call it our Gift to the Nation's Christmas Offering on December 4th. You see, etched in Lottie Moon's mind, by the, uh, mind and heart by the Spirit of God were the demands of Romans chapter 10. I've titled our message this morning just that, The Demands of the Gospel. And in verses 14 through 21, there are three primary audiences. And because there are three primary audiences, I see three demands of the gospel. And the very first demand of the Christian gospel is this, for believers... The gospel demands activity, not passivity. I want you to see the they in verses 14 and 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Who is the they? The they is the, look, look all the way back in chapter 9, verse 33. The very, I, uh, the, that word, whoever. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. If you drop down to chapter 10, verse 11, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. So that when we read then in verse 14, how then will they call on him? The they is referring to the whoever or the everyone. In fact, let's begin with verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not heard? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? There is a progression here. You, you can't call on someone you don't believe in. You, you can't believe in someone that you've never heard of. And you can't hear of someone unless somebody has preached it. You see, authentic faith then, authentic faith is based upon true content. That is why Paul preaches Jesus to the Jewish people. He is not going to back down for proclaiming Christ. The word preached, or preacher, depending on the translation that you have in front of you, This is not a formal Sunday morning monologue where somebody gets up, right, and gives you three points in a poem and a catchy little illustration here and there. The the, the preaching here, brothers and sisters, is just simply telling the gospel. Just simply, we would say, I shared the gospel. I I gave the gospel. It's it's the one-to-one. Brothers and sisters, I love 
sports stadiums filled with evangelists preaching the gospel. I love churches that are jam-packed with children or with students or with adults gathering to hear the gospel, but do you know what God's primary plan of the gospel moving forward? It is the preaching, not of the preacher, but of the body. This is God's plan. This is God's plan A, and there is no plan B. Here are the responsibility then is not on the, listen to this, the responsibility is not on the unbeliever to move toward the gospel. The responsibility is on the believer to move toward the unbeliever. This is, look to, see this in verse 15. It reads this way, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And Paul is quoting from the prophet Isaiah here. He's, he's quoting Isaiah 52, verse 7. In context, here's what Isaiah is talking about. Isaiah, in Isaiah 52, Isaiah is talking about the, about the prophets who are saying to the nation of Israel, who are in exile under Babylon, that there's coming a time where they get to go back to Jerusalem. And the prophets who get to share a message like that, Isaiah says, how beautiful are their feet. They get to preach the good tidings to God's people. But if the feet of those preaching this message of the return from Babylon to Jerusalem are beautiful, how beautiful are your feet when you proclaim Christ's deliverance to those bound in chains? Brothers and sisters, was your heart not moved to hear Juan and Sandra's testimony this morning, and that God wants to do that. You think about those empty chairs that are right here and right here, that God wants to do that in another Juan and Carlos's life, or Juan and Sandra's life here in Cyprus, and that those chairs are going to begin to be filled, not because of some great orator, but because of your faithfulness in spreading the gospel. This is God's plan. Now, to be sent, right? He says, how, how will they hear unless, there is, unless they're sent? Right? There, there is a tendency for, for us, to, for many, to see a passage like this, like this is for Billy Graham, right? Like he was a sent one. Or maybe more modern, more, more of a modern-day evangelist, Greg Laurie. Perhaps pastors or missionaries are the sent one. But Christian, have you not been commissioned have we not been commissioned by our Lord? Think of these. Think of Matthew chapter 28. Think of Luke at the, end of the, at the end of the book, or even John. And if that's not enough, right, you're reading the very first, uh, first chapter of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, they're told to go into all the world and preach the gospel, right? When we watch Missions videos that we started the service off with of a church plant in Canada by a, Pac- I think Pakistani or Afghani, I can't remember who, who, the video now. We, we must remind ourselves this. When a tear comes to our eyes as we see Juan and Carlos and how they came to faith in Christ or a video like that, that sympathy or empathy or emotion is no substitute for action. It is not enough to just simply be empathetic to these these calls or these demands upon us. Grace Life, I know, I know that we have no ability to manufacture pastors or those who will be sent out from us. But I do understand, right, we all pray we all send, and then, some, then, then we tend to say, and some go. But the command is that all of us make disciples everywhere we go. It's not just that some go, it's that all go, it's just that we just happen to be going in different directions. But I would ask this of us, and I sit among you when I ask this question. Are we content as a church to never, to never 
send anyone? Are we content with that? If your child came home from Sunday school or kids' church, in our kids' church, every Sunday they're watching videos of Lottie Moon just kind of telling the story. If your child came home from Sunday school or kids' church and expressed interest in international disciple-making, would, would you ignore the comment hoping that it's just a passing thought? Or would you prayerfully engage with their heart? Would would we seek to discourage our teenagers from using his or her business interests overseas for the gospel's sake, since it's safer here? This, this This is the call, this is the claim, this is the demand that the gospel makes upon a Christian church and Christian people, that we are not passive, kind of kind of doling out our funds to kind of the 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 for the gospel for higher people, salving our consciences. I want to give you a quick some some pictures as we think about what does it mean that to go into all the world. This next, the, each of those little logos there represent our primary missionary partners, gospel partners around the world with the International Mission Board. And I want to focus in on this section right here called Central Asia. If I can do, there we are. A look at Central Asia. So I want you to notice this number right in here, right? We're talking about pe- people can't, people can't uh, believe on whom they have never heard, and how will they hear unless there is a preacher, right? So in in Central Asia, I counted them this past week. I can't remember them now. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine countries. In, in Central Asia, and of those nine countries, there's 385 million people, and of those nine countries, there's 386 people groups. A, a, a people group is a group that has a unique culture, potentially a unique language or a dialect uh, un, unique to them. And so when, when missiologists, people who are thinking about seeing the gospel go forward, talking about we're not just sending people to countries, we're sending people to specific people groups, all right? Here's the next one. So this is, the, this, is, this is Central Asia. Here's what lostness looks like. Of those 386 people groups, how many of those people groups do not have the gospel? With, there's 379 people groups in Central Asia with little to no evangelical influence, Right? Don't, don't think media, CNN, Fox News, when you think evangelical, it just simply means a gospel, the gospel presence, right? It has nothing to do with politics. Of those 386, 379 uh, do not have a gospel presence that we're aware of. 39% of Central Asian people groups don't have any church planting efforts. I'm reading that right here. So when we read a passage like Romans 10, that the gospel has to move out, what we're thinking about is this, right? And I just, we're just looking at Central Asia. I didn't show you North Africa and the Middle East. I didn't show you Central America or South America or any of those other areas. I want you to, I want to show you then this next slide about what God did this past year amongst the the, the ministry partners that we have in Central Asia, okay? Here's the gospel transformation. So, of this past year in 2021, nearly 51,000 people heard the gospel. Uh, a little more than 2,000 confessed Christ. And there's some baptisms and number of churches that were established. And then the number of leaders, whether it be potential pastors uh, or lay leaders within, within the body there. Now, brothers and sisters, we praise God, right? This is, a slide worth, this is a slide worth celebrating over right here, right? We praise God for what he is doing. But I want to ask this question. What, what, if, what if Grace Life were more intentional, more prayerful 
about discipling and challenging our members to respond to Romans 10.14, which says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed, and how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? What, what would potentially happen? So this is just Mosier playing around with numbers here, right? I'm just, this is just my own slide that I made up, right? I have no idea. <laughs> But, but what if in God's kindness, three years from now, ten years from now, we were able to send someone to Central Asia ourselves? Would that number be 50,927? Would it be 2,149? Would it be 607? You know, all the way through. I, I don't know what it would look like. It, it's passages like this in Romans 10, why we have a gift to the nation's Christmas offering. It's why we disciple. By the way, when we're thinking about Sunday school or a kids' church, it's not just child care for an hour. What we are thinking about is, what can I do to instill God's heart for the nations in our children's hearts? This is what we are attempting to do. So your Brothers and sisters, your faithfulness, whether you end up going to Central Asia or you keep living on the same cul-de-sac that you've lived on for the past 20 years and you are obedient to God in doing so, right? Your faithfulness is a part of the next generation growing up within a healthy church so that, they, so that it's their desire to see another church that reflects the glory of God in holiness that reflects the glory of God in love, that reflects the glory of God in unity, that it is their desire to see what they experienced and what they tasted here at Grace Life at 13515 Huffmeister Road at the 77429, that God would do that in Kazakhstan or some other part of Central Asia, that it would be replicated amongst unreached people groups. It will have a different building, different location, different styles of music representing its culture. But the point is this, is that we are responding to the, gospel, the demands of the gospel in activity. Here's the second demand by the gospel. I'll give it, I guess it's back over to you now, back there, Raven. Here's the second demand by the gospel that is for unbelievers. The gospel demands, whoops, go back one slide, sister, there you go. The gospel demands obedience. She wanted me to be done 10 10 minutes earlier. Whoever paid her off, you have to give that money back. What an interesting phrase in verse 16, right? They did not obey the gospel obey the gospel? I thought I'm supposed to believe in the Christ of the gospel. Paul says they did not obey the gospel. Paul is going to talk and write in Romans 1, he's going to talk about the obedience of faith. That the, that the, so we would understand this, that the good news of Jesus is not just an invitation to believe in him, as if somehow you can kind of take it or leave it. Like, Do you want Coke or you want Pepsi? I'll do water. No, 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 no. The the invitation to the gospel is actually a command to obey. Then the apostle Paul quotes Isaiah who says, who has believed what he has heard from us? That is, just as they did not believe Isaiah, they did not believe Paul, and most likely will not believe you. Let me speak to those of you then this morning who have not placed your faith in Jesus. You just heard me say that God says, obey me and have faith in my son. Perhaps you're here this morning out of duty to your children who are in a Sunday school class. Perhaps you're here out of duty to a spouse, grandparents, or maybe your parents twisted your arm. 
And try as you might, you can't work up the faith like they'd have. Like in, in some ways, maybe you even want it. But you can't seem to work up the faith to believe like those around you. And since this is a command to obey and express faith, Pastor Joel, what am I supposed to do? Look at verse 17 of Romans 10. Here's the answer. Here's what you're supposed to do. So faith, how am I going to work that one up? Faith comes from hearing. Huh? Hearing what? Hearing through the word of Christ. Faith will come to you not through emotional music and dim lights and a little bit of smoke. That's not how faith will come to you. It will not come to you through a moving experience at a worship service. What you need for faith is to hear the word of God preached. What you need is to hear the word of God read to you. Or for you to read it to yourself. And I would say to you, if you struggle with faith, here's my pastoral counsel to you, and that is continue to make yourself available to the Bible. Continue to open it up and say, God, I know this is your word, or at least I think that's what everyone tells me. Can you affirm this? Can you, can you reveal this? Can you give me understanding? Can you give me faith? And how will I get faith? Hearing comes through, hear, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You see, that is the demand of the gospel if you are not a believer in Jesus. The gospel demands obedience. It's not a, it's not a take, it, take it if you want it. Like it, God's command to you is believe the gospel. Here's the final command. And that is this. For Israel, the gospel demands humility. Because I said there were three audiences, right? The first audience are to believers, the second audience to unbelievers, and the third audience is to Israel itself. And I say humility because humility is essential. I'm, we're going to look at verses 18 through 21 in a second, or 20 through a second, but look at, so let's, end, let's start with verse 21. Why I say humility. Chapter 10, verse 21 says this way, but of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary or obstinate people. This is why Israel needed humility. We've said this before, but just so that we understand where we are in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 9 through Romans chapter 11 is a section that is giving consideration to God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. That is, and why some believed and why some rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Right, contextually, what is Paul doing here? Paul has been arguing that if people have a preacher, they'll have knowledge. And if they have knowledge, they'll be able to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. So what about the Jewish people who had plenty of knowledge and plenty of preachers, right? You have this whole section of your Bible called the Old Testament filled, and their names are the titles of our books. Isaiah, Jeremiah. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi, right? Let alone Samuel and Moses, David, and others. So what, so what then, if that is true, if that logic is true, that in order to hear, you need a preacher so that the preacher can give knowledge, so that you can hear and express faith, so if that is true, what about the Jewish people who still haven't believed, Paul? Like your logic isn't holding up. Look at verse 18, Romans 10, verse 18. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world and then what we learn in the next two verses that follow, verses 19 through 20, is this, is that Moses and Isaiah are going to teach us that God is saving Gentile people, that's, that's us, unless you're Jewish, right? That God is saving Gentile people, here's why, causing and in saving us, causing 
Jewish people to become jealous. Look at verse 19. Well, Paul says maybe Israel didn't understand. Well, Moses says this. I will make you, Israel, jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Do you remember in Romans chapter 9, it was verse 26, when Paul says that those who were not my people are called my people? We learned that what he was quoting the prophet Hosea, right? That those who are not a nation will become a nation, that we will be a kingdom of priests to God. That the God of the Jewish people, here in verse 19, has become the God of the Gentile people. Those, those who are not a nation. I will make this foolish nation, I will make you angry through this foolish nation. That is, through Gentiles. Now verse 20, then Isaiah is as bold as to say this. I have been found, that is, God has been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. What is Isaiah so bold as if to say? Isaiah is so bold as to say this, that God has been found by those who were not seeking. Who, in, in comparison, who, who were the ones seeking? Jews or Gentiles? Jews. And yet the prophet Isaiah, all the way back in that old covenant book, right, which we think is primarily to Jewish people, he says all the way back there that Gentiles found the one whom they were not seeking. And that, hold on to this one, right? The nation of Israel that gets the burning bush, the ones that, they're, they're the ones who get the, the Ten Commandments written by the finger of God. That nation, he says, I have shown myself to those who didn't ask for me. Brothers and sisters, could there be any verse in the Bible that describes our personal, individual salvation more than verse 20? That we found someone whom we weren't looking for. That he showed himself to those who never asked. I was found by God and I didn't even know I was lost. That, that God showed himself to me through his word, and I wasn't even searching. And that just as the gospel demands of Jewish people humility, so it demands on all of us humility to receive and to believe it. Thank God he pursued when we weren't searching. Amen. Now, we began with Lottie's letters, right? And so we conclude with Lottie's letter. On February 9th, 1889, writing to Southern Baptist churches, I love her elderly picture there. That first picture, she looked like she was from the U.S., right? But not anymore. She had breathed the air of her people, and she had become them. I think that tells us something about our neighbors. Oh, I understand there's a, there's a, sense, of a, a sense of a philosophical culture in our own country to reject. I get that. But brothers and sisters, there is a sense in which we love the people around us. And she loved the Chinese people. And on February 9th, 1889, writing to Southern Baptist churches, she wrote, read, she wrote this, Recently on a Sunday, which I was spending in a village near Pingtu City, two men came to me with the request that I would conduct the worship services. They wished me to read and explain to a mixed audience of men and women, this, a, a, a worship service on a Sunday morning, the, the, the parable of the prodigal son. I replied that no one should undertake to speak without preparation and that I had made none. 
I've been busy all morning uh, teaching the women and girls. After a while, they came again to know my decision. I said, quote, it is not the custom of the ancient church that women preach to men. I could not. However, hinder, I could not, however, hinder their calling upon me to lead in prayer. Need I say, as I tried to lead their devotions, it was hard to keep back the tears of pity for those sheep not having a shepherd. Men asking to be taught and no one to teach them. We read of one who came forth and saw a great multitude, and he had compassion on them, because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And how did he show his compassion? He began to teach them many things. Brethren, ministers and students for the ministry who may read these lines, does there dwell in your hearts none of that divine compassion which stirred the heart of Jesus Christ and which led him to teach the multitude many things? She continues, 30 miles from Pingtu City is a gold mine. Nestled close among low-lying hills are two foreign houses and the buildings over the mine. Several American miners are there in the employ of the Chinese government. These men are living a hard, dull, isolated life in a remote region, far from home and friends, with the sole purpose of worldly gain so much for the devotees of mammon. One cannot help asking sadly, why is love of gold more important than love of souls? The number of men mining and prospecting for gold in Shangtung is more than double the number of men representing Southern Baptists. And she concludes, what a lesson for Baptists to ponder. I read these lines to you not in any way to shame any of us, but to provoke us, to give thought, to give consideration. This past week, I read this morning, this past week, five days ago, the earth welcomed, reading from the Washington Post, the earth welcomed its eight billionth living inhabitant, according to the UN. The figure represents an increase of 1 billion in global population since 2010 and 2 billion since 1998. In 1950, the world's population was less than a third of what it is now. So on November 15th, the UN declared that day, the day of 8 billion, appropriately named, said the Secretary General Antonio Guterres. He then went on to say this, it is an occasion to celebrate diversity and advancements while considering humanity's shared responsibility for the planet. And as followers of Jesus, as we think about the day of eight billion, we consider Jesus' words of the Great Commission, that eight billion represents more image bearers of God who need the gospel. And so we think and we pray and we strategize and we consider God, we're not a large group. We're not a massive church by any stretch of the imagination. But God, in your kindness, could we be a part of what the Christian church has been a part of for millennia? Certainly God did not just call us for more and more Christmas parties and gingerbread housing. Nothing wrong with either of those. We will fellowship and we will laugh and we will have fun and our unsaved neighbors will come to Decorate gingerbread houses, and we will develop those relations, deepen those relationships even more for one express purpose so that they too may gather around the throne people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation, and they and we will give praise to the Lamb for all eternity. 
You see, brothers and sisters, in Romans 10, the demand is for unbelievers to obey. But there is a demand upon us for believers to take the gospel to the unreached, whether it's Cyprus, Houston, or around the world.